Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six is where we're gonna be. Austin led us off and Pastor Jimmy taught last week and um, so I'm gonna keep us going through the book of Romans. Romans, if you've, if you've read this book, I encourage you to do so. It is both challenging and it's deep in theology. It can be heavy. It's, it's actually quite hard to teach. I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, and I really was kind of struggling through this, just asking the Lord, what, what do you want me to say and, and how, how to make this flow easier? Um, and, and even reading other translations to just look at what other translations are saying, um, it does help a lot because um, if you ever read Romans in the King James Version, nope. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm, I can't get past chapter one. Um, so anyway, we are gonna be in Romans chapter six and I'm gonna start in verse 15. I wanna give you just the backdrop of Romans just kind of in a nutshell again and then our, our theme for today is victory in Christ. So we're gonna be in Romans six, seven, and eight. We're gonna close with chapter eight, one of the best chapters I think in Romans Um, because it kind of summarizes everything we're going to be talking about. Victory in Christ Jesus. Romans, the book of Romans, has been called one of the greatest theological documents ever written. If you want to know about theology, Jesus, sin, uh, death, find it right here in Romans. In this letter, the the Apostle Paul explains the good news, though. All right, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the climactic revelation of God to the world through his son, the Lord Jesus. And Paul also reflects on our human condition, So on the meaning of our lives here on earth and the hope that we have in Jesus, he's going to touch on all of that. The heart of this good news is the offer of salvation in Christ for all who believe. That's the good news. If you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he has saved you from sin and from death, which is hell. He has saved you from that, and now you can walk in newness of life in him. And yes, we're going to still stumble and fall, but yet we have freedom in Christ now. We have the victory. So we're going to talk about that. Martin Luther, once uh, he actually, his, his biography is amazing. He read Romans for the, when, for the very first time, and he got saved by reading Romans. Um, he had realized, I had just been living a different lifestyle. Romans saved me. And he once said this in his preface to the epistles to the Romans. It's a commentary. He said, Romans can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. And that's true with this, the entire Bible. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So when you dive in, when you dig in, the Bible just becomes sweeter and sweeter. It never gets old, amen? The Bible never gets old, dry, weary, it, and it, it will last. Jesus said, heaven and earth are gonna pass away, but my words will never pass away. And they are timeless for every day. So we're gonna look at chapter six through eight, the theme that we are victorious over sin because what Christ has done Um, on the cross, even though we're gonna struggle with sin because we still live in a flesh um, and a body, and so we're gonna struggle with this. Paul's gonna actually get real and say, look, even though I'm an apostle, I still struggle with certain sins, just like everybody. We are all sinners saved by grace. So the Greek word actually for victory, if you're reading the New New Living Translation, Paul will use the word victory um, um, interchangeably with freedom and victory, but the word victory in the Greek is nikos, and we get our English word, anybody know? Nike. Nike. So Jesus is gonna be wearing some Air Jordans in heaven. (laughs) That was a really bad joke. Anyway, um, yeah, we get Nike from that. Let's read Romans chapter six, verse 15. Paul is gonna say this, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that through you were slaves of sin, though you were slaves uh, of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that the form of doctrine to which you were uh, delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God and have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray and then we're going to dive in. Father God, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for everyone here, even though it's just raining so much outside. I pray for everyone watching online as well. God, that you would just bring us together as one body in Christ. Lord, I pray as we dissect this challenging and also uplifting and encouraging book of Romans, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. You would open our hearts. You would open our our mind that we can receive from you, that your Holy Spirit can minister to us. What does it mean to have victory in you? Um, Even though we are still in a sinful body, how how do we um, combat that, Lord? So teach us now. Help us to learn something new and leave here changed, never the same. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Paul is going to ask five rhetorical questions in chapter six through eight. Rhetorical questions meaning that he's going to anticipate the reader who's going to be reading the epistle of Romans. He's anticipating that they're thinking of these questions and he's not asking them for an answer. He's going to give them the answer. But we're going to look at these five questions and actually dissect each question and go through chapter six, seven, and eight um, in regards to these. Because right now, now that we've switched gears from um, you know, what sin is. Now we're going to see that we can have victory over this sin. But he's going to ask five different questions, and they're going to be up here on the screen, and we're going to go one by one. But I want to give the five to you right up front. Number one, the first question is, should we keep on sinning so God's grace may abound? He asks that question right in chapter 6, verse 1. He's anticipating the readers are asking this. Should we keep on sinning so God's grace may abound? What does that mean? We'll come to that. Number two, Since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can keep sinning? That's chapter 6, verse 15. Since God's grace has set us free now from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Number three, the question he's going to ask as well is, is the law sin? That's chapter 7, verse 7. Is the law actually sin? Is it good or is it wrong? Number four, did the law cause my death, my spiritual death? Did the law cause me to stumble? Because now that we are under grace, so should we just forget the law? He's gonna ask this question, did the law cause my death? And then last but not least, number five, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? That's chapter eight, verse 35. So I'm just gonna give you the answer to every question, it's no. He's gonna say certainly not, of course not, no, but he's anticipating they're asking these questions. He wants to make sure I'm going to give you straight forward. I'm giving you doctrine, and then I'm, I know that you're thinking, well, can I, can I keep doing this then? Does that mean that? And he says, no, certainly not. Let's, let's dissect this a little more. So he's going to ask these questions, but he already knows what the answer is, and he's going to give it to them straight, to the, to the church in Rome. And, and let us know even for today. We still have these same questions. So let's go through them one by one as we study here in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. So number one, back to the first one. Should we keep on sinning so God's grace may abound? So this question actually comes from the previous chapter, chapter 5. If you go to chapter 5, go to verse 20 and 21. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be flipping a lot through the pages of God's Word. But chapter 5, verse 20, read it with me. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's saying this saying, when, wherever there's sin, grace abounds even more. Wherever there's sin, God's grace is even more. So then in chapter six, he's asking this question. He knows what they're asking. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace can keep abounding? And it's kind of like, you know what the answer is, but you just wanna kind of just cheat the system. Can we just keep sinning? And God's grace can abound and abound. Paul says, no, certainly not. You can't be doing this. We've already died to sin, and our new relationship to sin is possible because of the vital connection of Christ's death. So we've died to sin. What does that actually mean to be dead to sin? When, when Paul's going to ask this question, you've died to sin now, and you're, you can live now in Christ. When he says dead to sin, that does not mean entirely insensitive to sin and temptation, because we're still going to struggle with sin and temptation. That's still going to be a part of our human nature until we die. So he says, what what does that mean being dead to sin? Believers are still in a battle. That's in chapter 6, verse 12. You can read it. However, Christians no longer have to live as slaves to sin. 
there's a big difference. We no longer have to be bound to sin. We can choose now not to sin. We can choose now not to sin. That's in verse 6 of chapter 6. And verse 12, go to verse 12 of chapter 6. Paul says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Verse 12 basically tells us not to let sin control you the way that we live by giving into its evil desires. Why are you letting sin control you now if you're under the leadership of Christ? Rather, in verse 13, read verse 13 with me, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. So he says, rather in verse 13, give yourselves completely to God by doing what is right. That's what righteousness means. Just doing what is right in God's sight. That is righteousness. So he says, give yourselves completely to God by doing what is right. You are no longer bound to sin. Verse 14, read it with me. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law, but under grace. You are not under law, but under grace. So verse 14 says, sin is no longer your master. We are under grace now, not the law. Now that actually gets into a second question, because when he says that, then he asks the other question, and that's number two. So, well, since God's grace has set us free, does that mean we can go on sinning? There was something up with this church in Rome. They were all about, hey, we got God's grace, but can we still like, you know, party a little bit? Just have fun in Rome? I mean, when in Rome? I mean, come on, come on, Paul. They, they still had this mindset of like, can we just keep doing a little bit of sin? And Paul had to tell him like, hey, you're asking this question, I know the wheels are clicking, So he says, since God's grace has set us free from the law, we're under grace, does that mean that we can still go on and sin? The answer is no. Now the law of Moses was the governing power of the old covenant. The old covenant before Jesus came, um, basically the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, that was the law. And that was what every Jew had to abide by, live by, and that was your God, because it was God's law given to Moses. That governed in all of the Old Testament. Believers now, though, live under the governing power of Christ. Christ has replaced Moses. He didn't abolish Moses. Moses is still good, but he has now fulfilled Moses in the law. When you read the book of Hebrews, you're going to see how Christ is better than the angels. He's better than the Levitical law. He's better than Moses. And to hear that, like, whoa, Moses is our guy for the Jews. Moses is the man. And so for someone to say Jesus now reigns superior over Moses, that's a big deal. But we are now living under that. Paul basically says in verse 16, when you go to chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? What is he saying here? Paul's basically saying in verse 16, don't you realize that you become slaves to whatever you choose to obey? And that's still the same for today. You become a slave to whatever you choose to obey, whether it's in a sinful state or whether it's in righteousness. If you are enslaved and choosing to obey alcohol all the time, you're enslaved to alcohol. If you just choose, I'm going to, you know, watch pornography, but I'm still saved, you are a slave to pornography and sexual sin. You choose what you want to obey and who you obey, you're a slave to that. He says, so... Don't you realize that you become a slave whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, and that's going to always lead to death, spiritually and physically. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living and holiness. So He's going to contrast everything with here. And death and life are always in the balance. It's always death and life. You choose your way, it's going to lead to death. You choose God's way, it's going to lead to life. And he's making this clear. He says actually also... In verse 20, go to verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. He's basically saying when we were slaves to sin, we were free from the obligation to do what is right. Isn't that true? Before you got saved in Christ, you were free to do whatever you wanted. There there was no, you know, Bible regulations or rules you had to follow. You could do whatever you want. You were bound to yourself. And he actually talks about looking back, you, you, you're ashamed now of who you were prior to Christ. And some of you may have that strong testimony of like, wow, I was living a life of sin and immorality pre-Christ, and now when I look back, I'm kind of ashamed by that, but God's forgiven you of that, and you don't need to dwell on that anymore. But he says also in verse 22, 
But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end is everlasting life. So now we are free from the power of sin and become slaves of God. And I'd rather be a slave of God than a slave of sin. Amen? Because God is the ultimate perfect master that he wants to, to use us for his kingdom and his glory. And now we do things that lead to holiness. God's all about holiness. He, he's not about, you know, just doing this or that. He's just, if you practice holiness, then things will start to fall in place. And holiness means I'm separated or set apart from the world and culture. We, we all know culture's agenda, right? Now, if you want to practice holiness, set yourself apart from what culture's doing, and you're going to practice holiness, righteous living. And Jesus even said, you know, be holy as I am holy, to practice holiness. And that's our strive, which leads always to everlasting life. And then he closes with the famous verse that everyone knows, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That could be a whole sermon right there on that verse. When you give into sin, when you, when you put stock in your sin, that leads to death. But a gift of God, it's a free gift, is eternal life. You don't have to work your way to it. You don't, have to, you don't earn it. God just gives it. It's a gift, and it's eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. The next question now he's going to ask, we're going to jump to number three. Next question he asks is, is the law sin? Now, this is in chapter seven. If you can uh, jump to chapter seven and actually go to verse seven, he's going to ask this next question. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. I'm going to pause right here. The question comes honestly from the previous six verses in chapter seven. You can read that later if you want to, but the previous six verses in chapter seven, Paul actually says some rather negative things about the law, but then he explains how God's law is good in order to guard against any notion that is evil in itself. Did I tell you Romans is pretty heavy? It's a lot. When you have to dig in, it, the wheels should be turning, but it's, it's, it's powerful what God is trying to tell us. Paul says in verse 7, I wouldn't have actually known what sin is except that the law showed my sin. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known this. In verse 8, he says, but sin, sin taking an opportunity by the commandment produced in me all kinds of sin. What does he mean by that? Look at verse 8. But sin now taking an opportunity by the commandment, he's using covetousness as an example, produced in me all manner of evil desire for apart from the law, sin was dead. What does he mean by that? If you want to circle that word opportunity, the word opportunity right there in the Greek is actually a military term for a position seized in enemy territory that becomes a base of operations. So he's actually in a way personifying sin and saying sin seized the opportunity of the commandment and knew I couldn't live up to it. So he takes the opportunity but also Paul by expressing God's demands, the commandment of God becomes now an occasion for sin to accomplish his deadly purposes. So that's why the question was, you know, is the law sin? Is the law just leading me to sin rather than in a relationship with, with Christ Jesus? Well, the law was always supposed to expose our sin in need for a savior. The law was actually never intended to save us, the law of Moses. It was actually just supposed to reveal what's inside our heart. But, but Paul is making it clear, sin took the opportunity and now when the Bible says, do not covet, I'm going to start coveting. It's only our human nature. You know, you know when we're growing up as kids and our parents say, hey, don't, you know, don't sit on that bench, it's wet paint. It says, the sign says it right there. What exactly do we do as kids? We want to test the waters. Let's see if this is really wet paint. You sit on it and it's wet. We, 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 we see a sign that says, don't do this or don't touch this or don't, don't go down this way. And yet we, we want to because now that there's the law, Sin now takes the opportunity to lead me now to death. He basically also says in verse 10, we jump to verse 10 of chapter 7, and the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. He's pretty harsh with about the law. He's saying, I discovered that the law's commands, which were actually supposed to bring me life, 
brought me spiritual death instead. So sin takes advantage. Sin takes advantage of the Ten Commandments. It deceives me now and lead me, leads me to death. And it's like, well, so Paul, is this law sin? And he has to say, no. Therefore, look at verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So he summarizes saying, look, the law is still good. It's still holy. It's still right. But now it's going to lead us to the next question. And here's question number four. Question number four is, well, did the law now cause my death? Did the law cause my death? Look at verse 13. Has, the, uh, has then what is good become death to me? The law? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that the sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. What's he saying? Paul tells us that sin used what was good, the law. And isn't this Satan? When God intends good, Satan likes to twist it for evil. Paul tells us that sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. It actually just shows how bad sin is. It really just shows how bad sin is. Sin wants to take every opportunity and, and, and seize it for a moment. And it just leads us nowhere. It leads us to death and it gives us empty promises. Sin is crafty. In verse 14, look at this interesting verse. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul actually says the real trouble is not the law, for the law is actually spiritual and good. The real trouble is me, because I'm a human, and I'm enslaved to sin. So he's not blaming the law. He still takes responsibility. In verse 15, Paul gives us the famous words of wanting to do right, but still doing wrong. And I'm not going to read it, because it's a lot of do's, do's, don't do, want to do. You can read it, and I get tongue-tied saying it. What I don't want to do, I do. What I do want to do, I don't. I, 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 okay. He says, Paul gives us this famous thing. He says, I want to do right, but yet I still end up doing wrong. Is anybody else like this? It's called the battle of the flesh and the spirit. And Jesus actually said this to his disciples. Your spirit is willing, but your body is weak. We all actually want to do the right thing. Everybody does. Everyone deep down, whether you're a Christian or not, knows the difference between right and wrong. Actually, now that we're living in 2020, I, that probably isn't the case anymore. We don't know what is right and wrong anymore, so we're living in the Isaiah time, where Isaiah said, woe is that generation that says good evil and evil good. That's what we're living in now. Um, but deep down, we're all given a, a conscience. We should know what right and wrong is. But yet we still end up doing what we don't want to do. When he said, I discovered the law's commands, oh, I'm sorry, when he says in verse 15, the famous words, doing what is right, but still doing wrong, and if you go to verse 17, Paul is not evading responsibility for his sin. Look at verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's not saying, you know, it's, it's no longer me that sins, it's the, it's the sin that captivates me. He's not, saying, not, he's not saying I don't have responsibility for my sin. It's not what he's saying. He's saying rather he is saying that because he is genu genuinely wants to do what the law commands, some other factor must be causing him to do just the opposite. And that factor is sin living inside of us. We're all in a sinful nature. We're all born with a sinful nature. That's because since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we are now under the curse of sin, and all of us are born with a sin nature. But Paul is actually saying, from verse 17, he, he is experiencing a divide between his will and his actions. And our will, ultimately, I think, wants to please the Lord, but our actions sometimes don't back that up. And some, when I first read this, and there, there's been books and commentaries that I've read about this, it's, it's somewhat liberating because he says, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And again, he's not saying, I'm not taking the responsibility for my sin and action, but he's saying, you know, I want to do the right thing. I love God's law, but yet the sin that entangles me just always causes me to trip up. 
And, but he still is telling us that the law didn't cause our death. It, it still is us that we have to understand that we are living in a sinful nature. He explains this in Galatians chapter 5. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, you don't have to right now. We can write it down. Galatians chapter 5 is that famous passage of the flesh and the spirit, the battle that we are going to have for the rest of our life, that when we want to live to please the spirit, we will not want to live to please the flesh. But if we live to please the flesh, we will not want to live to please the spirit. And there's a constant battle. And that's really only because you're saved. If you're not saved, you don't have that battle. It's only when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're going to have the battle. You're going to have to understand, I got to start living for the spirit and stop living for myself. When am I going to start giving over to the spirit's ambitions for my life and his direction I follow rather than just following what I want to do and living in my sin. Paul delights in God's law with all his heart as we should, but he still has a struggle with the flesh and the spirit. But he actually cries out. Look what he says here in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, I take comfort in Paul being one of the greatest apostles and evangelists that has ever lived to actually be honest and vulnerable and saying, I still struggle with sin. Isn't that awesome? Because we all do. But some of us are not wanting to really talk about that. And Paul says, I struggle with it. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Like just, Lord, I just want to be with you. He would say that in one of his other letters. I'd rather be with the Lord than in this stinking body here on earth, but God has other plans. I'm going to preach for you, but I'd rather be with him. He once had a vision. God God actually took uh, Paul to the third heavens, it says, where he saw things that he couldn't even explain. And when God sent him back to earth, Paul says, I'd rather be with the Lord. It was amazing. But I know that God has a plan and purpose for me, and I'm going to do his, his call. But he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's going to save you. He's going to help you through this. We're all going to still struggle with sin. And we can't always blame the law. We have to take responsibility. But we also know that God is patient with us as we struggle in sin. Amen? God's patient with you and I in our struggle with sin. I mean, you sin just coming here. I sinned, you know, today. Is God patient with you and I? Certainly he is. We all deserve death. We all deserve hell, separation from God. But he's given us a way, and it's the only way, and it's through Jesus. For everlasting life. And the law could never do that. The law just exposed us to who we really are. It leads us now into chapter 8, verse 1. If you go to chapter 8, verse 1, one of the most Encouraging verses, not only in the book of Romans, but in all of the Bible, I believe. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul can triumphantly proclaim that those who belong to Jesus, that are saved, that are Christians, need not to fear that they will be condemned for their sins. God has wiped them clean. He says, I don't even remember them, and I've tossed them as far as the east is from the west and I'll remember your sins no more. There is no condemnation. Satan does that. He'll bring up the past. Jesus says, if you're in me, there's no condemnation. I am not going to condemn you. The final and last question that we're going to look at for today. Number five, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? No. Amen? Amen. Nothing can ever separate us from Christ's love. If everyone can go to chapter 8, We're going to close with verse 35. Chapter 8 is a long chapter. I'm going to break it down with you as we close. Chapter 8 is all about our our assurance of eternal life in the Spirit by walking in Him. Now that we see the struggle that we have with sin and we are victorious in in sin uh, and victorious in Christ because Christ has freed us now, now the Spirit has to remind us, hey, you have the hope of eternal life Heaven is just on the other side. We can have this glorious hope. Look at verse 2 of chapter 8. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law 
of sin and death. So verse 2 tells us that the power of the Spirit has freed us from the power of sin. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And verse 3, look at verse 3. It says, for what the law could not do in that it was, the, it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He's talking about the cross. God says, I'm going to do something that the law couldn't do. I'm going to send my son Jesus. The law of Moses could never save us. That's why Jesus had to come. Jesus had to come to be our atoning sacrifice for our sins. He had to become like us. He is still fully God and fully man, even right now in heaven, interceding for us. And Paul is making this case, look, we still are going to struggle with sin. But the law now exposes it, but don't rely on the law. Look at Jesus who doesn't condemn us, and he has sent his son Jesus to save us from our sinful state. If you go to verse 15 and 16, he's now going to start talking about once you become a believer, you are now adopted into the family of God. You are now a child, a son and daughter of Christ. V verses 15 through 16, look at this with me. These are great as well. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now I have to make this clear as well as we're closing. Not everybody is a child of God. Now the, the world thinks this, and I think culture always talks about we're all children of God. I don't know what God they're believing in, but we're not a child of God until you are adopted into his family. And how are you adopted into his family? By faith in his son, Jesus Christ. You trust him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you follow after him. You have accepted him as savior. Then you're adopted into Christ's family. And you, now you become a child of God. And the world is not gonna teach that. So we have to understand, in the house of God, that's what it means to be a child of God. We're not a child of God. Actually, the Bible says, on the contrary, you're an enemy of God before knowing Christ. You're an enemy of God. That's why it's so powerful that Christ came and died for us because he made a way for us now to get to heaven. Amen. That we no longer have to be enemies of God, but we can be a friend of God, a child of God, and co-reigners with Christ. It's amazing that what God has done for us. It's amazing. And I want to just touch on this Abba Father part because when Paul uses that term Abba, Abba was used in an intimate family context. And the word Abba really just means daddy. Not father, not dad, not, you know, papa. It's daddy. Now, I have two young daughters, and I think you know where I'm going with this. And I love hearing them call me daddy. How much more do you think God loves it when his children call him daddy? We can actually call God daddy. No other religion, no other religion says that. And Christianity not being a religion, so as I talked on Sunday, it's a relationship and this is how much God loves us. He says, don't even just call me father, call me daddy, it's personal. He says, the spirit lets us cry out, Abba, because he's adopted us. God is in the adoption business. He loves adopting. And I know adoption in our culture today is such a beautiful thing. When you adopt a child that's estranged from their family or doesn't want to be wanted anymore, and you adopt that child into your family now, how, how God has done that for you and I. He's adopted us. And we can cry out, Daddy, I love you. And he's right there with open arms. Paul says in verses 18 through 30, I'm not going to read it, but he talks about the future glory that awaits us. And whatever we're suffering through right now, it does not even compare to what awaits us in Christ Jesus. He says the suffering that you're going through right now doesn't even compare into the glory that we're going to have when we're with Jesus face to face. I want to close with this section. Paul closes in verses 31 through 39. If you go to verse 31, 
He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, what these things are he, is he talking about? He's referring to chapters five through eight. These things that we've just talked about in chapters five through eight, what then shall we say about these things? If God is for us now, who can be against us? And the ultimate question that he closes with that we have on the screen now, can anything now separate us from Christ's love? And the answer is no, capital N, capital O, nothing, no one can separate us from the love, and the Greek word is agape, which means unconditional love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at verse 37. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We have now victory in Christ Jesus because of his love and what he's done for us on the cross. Nothing that you and I could ever do. It was everything that Christ did. We are more than conquerors through Jesus. I want to summarize everything that we just talked about now as we close in prayer. But on the screen it says here, we are free now from sin because what Christ has done. But we will still struggle with sin because of our flesh. But we can now live in the power of the Spirit who gives us the assurance of eternal life. Amen? Amen. 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 That is the power of victory over sin and death. Would you pray with me as we bow our heads and close our eyes and just thank the Lord. I just want to thank him for now giving us the victory the victory over sin and death because what Christ has done for us by dying for us. Now that we have the hope of eternal glory, we are adopted into his family. We're still gonna struggle with sin. God is patient with us and he's got a plan for us, but we don't no longer have to be bound to our sin. We are free now in Christ. Father God, we thank you so much. We just worship you. We thank you. We love you for who you are and what you have done for us 2,000 plus years ago on the cross. Lord, for, for some of us, the cross is just a jewelry that we wear on our neck. Lord, the cross is so much more than a piece of jewelry. The cross is what we cling to with our very lives because you made a way you have given us victory. We are now more than conquerors because of your love, your agape love. You've adopted us now into the family of God. And all we have to do is just take it by faith. The law is not bad. The law is actually good. Your law is good, holy, and perfect. But it's, it's exposed some sin in our lives, which is good. Because, Lord, then it points us that we can't win this battle on our own. We need a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ, your son. We look forward to the day when we will be with you in glory. For now, Lord, we are wanting to be patient in our suffering. Some of us are going through some suffering issues and afflictions and tribulation. But I just wanna read from the pages of your word, Lord, from Romans. Just came to my mind. And when you say here, Lord, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? No, Lord, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that promise. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name everyone said amen and amen.